The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. What happens to the baby that's born and then dies? And uh, so we're going to talk about that today because this is part of our story of Matthew 2. We read it last time, and I'm, I want us to, I'm going to start at verse 16, even though this starts at 13. We, we, we dealt with this, and, and last night we dealt with verse 16, 17, and 18 about this prophecy of Jeremiah, a voice heard in Ramah weeping in great mourning in verse 18, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted because they were no more. Herod was dead. Behold, an angel appeared in the dream to Joseph in Egypt. You remember, he had sent him to Egypt, saying, Arise and take the child and his mother and go into the land of Israel. For those who thought, sought the child's life are dead. So he arose and he took the child and his mother and he came to the land of Israel. And we hear that Archias was reigning over Judah in the place of his father Herod. Uh, he was afraid to go there, and being warned by God in a dream, he departed for the regions of Galilee, and he came and resided in a city called Nazareth, uh, that what was spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. I want to show you something. I want to show you something. I want you to pay special attention. Now, I'm picking this subject up in verse 13 going through 23, but I want you to pay special attention to the word fulfilled. Uh, and on my papers, uh, probably at, um, at some point on my paper, I have mentioned this. I think it's on point two on the back side of your paper. In verses 13 through 15, I just want to show you the word fulfilled. In, there is a word, in verses 13 through 15, this was fulfilled what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. And he, he talks about Hosea. In 16 through 18, in that section, it says that what then what had been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. Then there is a third section, 19 through 23. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets, uh, and that's plural. And it's a reference to many prophets that bring this prophecy of Nazareth. Okay? Now, the secret to that is the secret to the lesson I'm about to teach you today called the providence of God. Because what covers babies theologically and scripturally is the providence of God. It's the providence of God. And almost all of Christianity believes that and has believed that for ions. There are different views about it, however, and I'll explain them to you, and I'll show you the view that I hold, having done an examination of all this. After a word of prayer, let's pray. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest under the etiquette of classroom. Etiquette is confession of sin. Can't study the Bible in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins. It could be sins of the tongue or overt sins. These must be confessed in silence. According to 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, name, sight, agree with God on the issue, it could be in any of those categories, he is faithful and just. When we confess our sins, he is God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse it from all unrighteousness. It's a passage speaking to believers because of the importance of the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit, especially in the teaching hour. It's a key in both the learning, the guiding, and the living. And so, Father, we thank you tonight for these that have come our way by automobile and by Internet. We pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God about the providence of God and babies and the mentally challenged who cannot hear to understand to believe to be saved. What about these people? We will answer that with clarity tonight through the word of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I said, this is our last one because of the 
children of Bethlehem, the male children of Bethlehem in the wider vicinity that were murdered uh, by Herod two years and under. Okay? And as I mentioned in my introduction, as a pastor, I face these questions a lot. Uh, and it, it was really interesting when I came to Christianity um, I had already seen a warfare of different opinions within the, the cr Christianity. I had seen two different denominations in Christianity uh, at loggerheads over this issue. And um, so I was really interested in this subject matter. And I, and I have been in my <coughs> theological studies. A common question that's always uh, uh, often asked what does the Bible teach regarding the very young or the mentally challenged who are unable to hear, to understand, in order to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ? When you explain that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, that by grace you're saved through faith and not of yourself, it is a gift of God, and you go over that and explain it and maybe draw it and illustrate it and do what you can with it, and there's no understanding. They, they can't hear to understand in order to perceive it and comprehend it. Then how does God deal with these people who are under Adam's sin at birth? I mean, how does that happen? I mean, we, kn we know that's a true theological premise based on Romans, the fifth chapter, among many. But Romans 5, 12 through 21 just nails it. Wherefore, as by one man sinner the world and death by sin, and so death is passed upon all men, for all are under this sin. I mean, it doesn't get clearer to me than that. How do we deal with this situation? And so that, that can be a complexing question. And so in theology, we've wrestled this out under providential grace, and not not providential grace, but providential, a provi the providence of God, would be a better way to explain it. Unger, in his uh, Bible dictionary, uh, deals with this. Most theologians are forced to deal with it. Most pastors are forced to deal with it, or priests, or whoever is in the Christian church. The providence of God, Unger writes, that the providence of God designates the continual care which God exercises over the universe which he has created. Okay? Now, I like ISBE. We call it ISBE. That's the International Bible Encyclopedia, International Standard Bible Encyclopedia. We call it ISBE for those who... Uh, this is a classic co commentary of, of explanations. Uh, in my opinion, has the best definition, the one at least fits my life best. It says, the di divine providence referred to, refers to preservation, care, and governing which God exercises that he has created. Now watch this. See, Unger said the same thing, except he adds this phrase that I think is really important. And, and, and it is the key to the omniscience of God. If you don't understand the essence of God, you will never understand uh, prov prov uh, providence of God. You'll never understand it. But if you understand God's essence, that, that if you understand a little bit about sovereignty and if you understand a little bit about omniscience, this would be helpful to understand what they're about to say. It says he has done this in order that they may accomplish divine providence refers to preservation, care, governing, which God exercises that over that which he has created in order that they may accomplish the ends for which they were created. And that's the key. That's providential. That We call that the providence of God in theology. And I can't tell you how important that principle is. And I'm going to show it to you. Uh, give you clarity on it as well. For example, I want you to go to Matthew. I'll show it to you in Matthew, in Matthew 5 and 6. I I'll show it to you. I'm going to pull out just a few scriptures. 
kind of gives you the idea, and then you can find it everywhere in the Bible. But in Matthew 5, uh, 45, um, he says, In order that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for and here it is, for he causes his son, notice that's S-U-N, to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. See, now you understand that's right? Now I want you to go back. Do you, do you see that in your Bible? Yeah, put your eyes on it. See, that's important. What's he do? He, the son. And we could say air. We could say anything we wanted. The creative order, right, is part of the creative order. The creative order under the providence of God has a divine purpose in order that they may accomplish the end for which they were created. Do you understand that? So he, he, he allows here the, the sun shines. If you've heard this probably that the sun shines on the good and the bad, the righteous and the unrighteous. That's, a, that's the providence of God. Okay? And then in the sixth chapter, he does this again, a very famous passage on, uh, you know, don't worry, business. And in the sixth chapter, in verse 26, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow, neither do they reap, nor do they gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Now, we don't call that grace. We don't call that grace, even though in the concept it is, because that word is kind of taken for soteriology. It's soteriology has won that verse. But what we do call this is the providence of God. What takes care of these birds? The providence of God. They were, they were created under an order where God says, I'll take care of you. And the birds know it. Fish know it. Land animals know it. Now, don't ask me. I don't know their language. But they know God's. And if you keep that in mind, when you study the Proverbs and the Psalms and things like Ecclesiastes, you will find this kind of information. You'll, you'll hear them talk that way. Um, then in verse 28, uh, And why are you anxious about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They don't toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that even Solomon, and they talk about the glory. Where does that come from? It comes from the, it comes from God creating them in such a way that this is their intended purpose. They have an intended goal and purpose. And sometimes we can see it in the glory of it. Right? Uh, and there are other passages. One, of, one that might be interesting to you about the providence of God is Psalms 104. You can read this on your own. It will well be worth your time when I tell you that the animals know this in their heart, in their soul, they know this. Psalms 104, 20 and 20, 21 and 22. It is well worth your read. Now, the lesson tonight is going to look at four aspects of the providence of God regarding the death of these male children two years and under of Bethlehem. One of the interesting stories on this very issue with small children like we have at Bethlehem is recorded in Exodus 1 and 2. In Exodus 1 and 2, we have a new pharaoh that comes to reign. New pharaoh that doesn't know Joseph. A pharaoh that does not know Joseph. And he begins to dealing harshly with the Israelites. And the, the more harsh he is with them, the, the more children they have. I mean, he can't squash them out. And he's getting nervous about the numbers that they're having. Overthrow and whatever. And so, notice I've, I've covered uh, ver, ch Exodus 1, 17, 22, in the second chapter, verse 3 and 6 and 10, just to give you a synoptic look after my point. 
because we're dealing with a, a baby Moses. The, mid, the Hebrew midwives, when they talk about midwives, they're talking about Hebrew. The Hebrew midwives feared God and did not do as the king had commanded, and that was to kill the babies at birth. They let the boys live. He wanted all the male boys dead. Then Pharaoh commanded all of his people, all the Israelites, the, the Hebrew midwives weren't obeying, so he commanded all the Israelites that he was authority over. This is what this means. He commanded all of his people saying, every son who is born to you are to be cast into the Nile River and every daughter you are to keep alive. When she, which is a reference to Moses' mother, could hide him no longer. In other words, he was weaned. Uh, she, got, she got him a, a wicker basket and covered it with tar and pitch. As we, and we know the story. And she put the child into it and set it among the reeds by the bank of the Nile. When she, Potiphar's wife, I mean, uh, Pharaoh's daughter, opened it, she saw a child. Behold, the child, boy child, was crying. And she had pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrew children. In verse 10, she said, we will call him Moses because I drew him out of the water. It's what Moses means, the name Moses. Now, what is working here is the what we call in theology the providence of God. You understand that? Now, I want you to go back and look at Isby. The things that God has created, that he is in control over the creative order, God providence is to preserve, to care, to govern uh, what God exercises that he has created. Watch this now. In order that they may accomplish the ends in which they were created. Do you understand that? And here's a perfect example. Do, I mean, we know the history of this man, Moses, don't we? In the providence of God, this child is born. God has, it, from eternity past, has, ha, has a role for him to play. But we're before this. We've got this child being born in a situation. And how is he going to be preserved and cared for? You understand? It's called the providence of God. And you can see it in this story. He's a baby. He's a baby. See, when you look back at Isby's definition, you can see, can you not see that? Yeah. So now how do we apply this? Now this is what's important because once you understand this formula, you can apply this anywhere in the Bible. So I took Moses, a story we'd probably all be very familiar with, both here and on the Internet, to show you how that worked. I just walked you through a little bit of chapter 1 and 2 to give you an idea. He's a baby. He's not, he's not, a believer. He's not like Joseph, who is a believer and gone, and God has already spoke to his heart. And all that. He's not like that. See? So once you understand the formula, I, let's take and see if that formula, how that formula works with the children at Bethlehem, okay? We can apply it by dividing our lesson into three sections. That's Matthew 2, 13 through 23. Listen, by the, by the Greek word fulfilled, which is pleroo. This is really important to this, to this principle. And, and we could have started with Bethlehem, and we could have taken this back to Moses, and you could have seen it just as well. You can, once you understand the formula, you can apply this principle anywhere in the Bible, just like you can, for by grace I save through faith, and not of yourself the gift of God. And the key is, by looking at 13 through 15 with the word fulfilled, 16 through 18 with the word fulfilled, and 19 through 23 with the word fulfilled. And what is the word being fulfilled? It is the prophetic word of God. It's prophetic word of God about the birth of Christ and now, and, and now the death of these babies. 
right? Jeremiah 31, 15 is about the death of the Bethlehem babies at the time of the birth of Christ. This makes it a very interesting story. While the other prophecies are, are oriented towards the Christ child, specifically, this is not. It is indirect to the Christ child. It is direct to the children of Bethlehem prophetically. When you look at this word fulfilled, it is the key to this aspect of these children in Bethlehem. When you examine the Isbe's definition of the providence of God, what was the end for which these Bethlehem, Bethlehem children were created? What was the end? To fulfill Jeremiah 15, 31, 15. I mean, he tells you, it was, he, listen. <laughs> look at Matt, look at Matthew 2.18. Look, look at Matthew 2.18. Verse 17 says, then that which was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet. See, we're talking about, we're talking about eight, 586 B.C. business. Now we're down into 4 B.C. business. We're talking about children two years and under. Agreed? What's at work here? What's at work? Here's what's work. In the providence of God, what was the end, you see? What is the end of their creative purpose? What is the end? If you can understand that and grasp it, not fall apart, then you might understand how God deals with death. So much different than man does. And it might help you the next time it comes around in your life with someone you love to understand this is not a bad thing. This is a good thing in the providence of God. Is that not true? The providence of God makes such a difference how you perceive things. See what I mean? And I'm going to promise you, you're going to have people in your life time of opportunity ministry that needs to hear this. Prophecy fulfillment reminds us that God's in control of human history. Prophecy fulfillment Reminds us, listen, there's 500 years passed between the prophecy that was given and its fulfillment. Who's in charge when we're not? The one that's always in charge whether you are or not. And how does that work? Providence of God. Theologically, the prophecy fulfillment reminds us, and just think how much prophecy just think how much the word of God fulfilled in our life every day. I tried to keep up with that one time. I thought, well, I think I'll just run a check. It got nuts. Try that for a week. Think how much doctrine, think how much of the word of God you think, pray, and apply to your life. It becomes minute. You could catch a phone call, and the first thing you know, you're talking with God as well as the person on the phone. You can have a, hold a conversation with yourself on something, and the first thing you know, you're talking with God in, the, in your mind, right? It's, it's the darndest thing I ever saw. I tried to, I tried to keep up with that, and I went, this is, this is just crazy. I can't believe I think that much about God. I was amazed in myself. You will be too if you just have to think about it. That's how you know how you're growing. 
Your conversational life with God is through his word, is it not? Your conversational life with God is, is about the word of God. You know, I've just learned when people come to me, they go like, oh, Ron, I'm just that, that. You know, I know in my mind, my mind immediately goes to the word of God. My mind goes into a category of the word of God, and I have the answer on my tongue. You know what I've had to learn to do? Shut up. Because I know in my heart, I can fix them in a heartbeat. But wait, that's not my job. My job's not to fix people. My job is to love people and to help them fix themselves. Yeah, let God fix you. Yeah, if I fix them, they're going to keep coming back to me. If, if God fix them, they'll keep coming back to him. You know, it's just who the, who the great physician is. And, and I've had to learn it because people come in, oh, and I go like, well, I got your problem. I got it. I got it. I got it. And I do have it. But it won't help them. It will help me. So I've had to learn to be patient, listen to them, give the information to them, tell them how to exercise it. You know, you can, you can buy a bike. I'm afraid to ride it. You get them training wheels, but you, you can't ride it for them, can you? And God put that in my heart one day in counseling. You keep, you get them, you give them a bike and then you ride it all the time. And I, it seems to me that that's your bike and not theirs. No, it's their bike. Well, how come you're riding their bike all the time and they're not? It is the word of God that gets fulfilled in your life that puts a bright light in you. And it puts a bright light in you. It can take darkness. It can cover all the darkness in your heart, boy. The light of the word of God. It's an amazing thing. The other part of prophecy fulfillment is not just the fact that God is in control of human history in your life. But this. Now listen to me. Listen close to me now. Because this is the providence of God at work. His perfect plan. You know, we talk about the perfect plan of God. It is perfect. We don't, we don't really believe that true in our heart until we, 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 you know, we have some experiences and go like, listen, I believe that's perfect. I believe the word of God leads me into a perfect plan of God. And you only get that if you, if you stop, you realize that, listen, every time I get to take a hold of the plan of God, it becomes imperfect. I got to let the perfect plan of God take a hold of my life. That's perfect. Now listen. I want you to listen to this perfect plan. Here's the perfect plan. This is, this is what you need to understand about providence of God. His perfect plan includes, listen to me now, all events and actions related to the timing of all causes and conditions of one indivisible system. <laughs> that's your life, buddy. That's your Monday. That's your Tuesday. That's your Wednesday. That's your Thursday. I don't know how to say it shorter. I don't know how to say that shorter, but I'm going to say it again. The perfect plan of God includes all events, all actions related to the timing of all causes and conditions of one indivisible system. Every link being part of the integrity of the whole. There are no accidents. There are actions, but not accidents. Yeah. We don't, we don't live by fate. We live by faith. Now, if you really want to see this in a way that goes into great length, is you go to Ecclesiastes, the third chapter, and study it. <laughs> you read it, but you don't study it. If you was to go into Ecclesiastes and break Ecclesiastes down at least into three sections and study it, it would amaze you what God will tell you about his perfect plan. And when you got through with that, you would come back to understand what I just said. All events and actions related to the timing of all causes and conditions of one indivisible system where every link is part of the integrity of the whole. Now, I tell you how you can do this. That's kind of wordy, and I don't know how to 
I don't know how to give it theologically any simpler, but just take some incident in your life that's past that you feel good about now that you didn't feel good about then. <laughs> and apply this to it. And then you will see that God did some pretty amazing things with that. You struggle to yourself out of it and you're on your feet today and you can look back to it and you can see how all of that event occurred and how that was good. And now I know it. And that helps you the next time a situation, some of that, it comes to your life. It gives you the encouragement to be able to handle it in a little bit better way on the front side rather than on the back side. Right? It's been true in my life. I can only speak about myself. Time and events. Causes and conditions. When you read Ecclesiastes. Third chapter and really look at it. You're going to find some amazing things. A third thing. And, and here's how Christianity has dealt with the providence of God. With the death of children. Almost all Christian theologians agree. That the providence of God applies to the death of children. Who die without gospel accountability. Like these children did. Two years and under. There are three basic theological views. That I'll share with you. There may be more. But these are the biggies. There is one view. Called baptismal regeneration. It is used as an. As an, an initiatory right. Into the. Into the. In, into the. Eighth day. You know the Bible talks about the eighth day. We can count them alive. And then we, we, we give them. In, in the Hebrew old, old covenant. We gave them a name and circumcised them as a male. Right. And brought them in. Uh, initiation right. Right. The initiation. And so many take this concept. Old covenant concept. And they apply it. Uh, to things like the Bethlehem children who, who were two years and under, um, they apply that concept, okay? They, they, they would take that. That's how they will deal with all children. Uh, they, will, they will baptize them at birth and, get, quote, get them sealed into the kingdom. Uh, they call it baptismal regeneration. And there's one group they do that. And uh, th th this is what the one group that I mentioned earlier about, uh, he couldn't get there and do that, and therefore this child was out in limbo. There's a second view that deals with christening, christening and um, God parenting, uh, who takes spiritual responsibility over a child uh, to see that the that this child is brought to gospel accountability, and you've probably been to Christian <clears throat> services uh, where many do this. Okay, there's the third view, the one that I hold to, where you teach believers that the providence of God is extended to all children and the mentally challenged until they're able to reach uh, gospel accountability. I I take that. From passages like these. Here is one in 2 Timothy. This is a very famous passage. The reason I picked these is because they're kind of famous. There's more than this, of course. Uh, talking about Paul. Uh, Paul talking to Timothy. Timothy, Paul is talking about Timothy, and he says that from childhood you have known the sacred scriptures which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ. And he's talking about, you remember, he talk, talks about his grandmother and his mother. You remember that? And then he goes on to talk about all scripture inspired. But it, this is part of that section where Paul talks about Timothy and uh, his mother and grandmother. Lois and Eunice or some like that. Uh, this is part of that. It will apply to anybody Men, uh, yes. Because that, that's where my daughter. Mm -hmm. Those who can't hear to understand to believe, they cannot do that. <clears throat> uh, another famous passage is Proverbs twenty-two six: Train up a child in the way he should go. 
uh, 1 Corinthians, the 7th chapter 14, that is where if, you're, if a, 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 a believer is married to an unbeliever, then there is, um, well, let me just read it. The, the, the child is covered under a principle of, let me just read it. That, so I don't miss misquote what's going on in there. 714. It, it, it's another one of those famous passages. 14. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified. Sanctified is the word I was looking at. The unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband. For otherwise your children are unclean and now they're holy. You remember that's a concept of having missionary living in the family. I mean, now you've got to live in missionary. There's a believer in the family. You, and that, that's why the, in many Christian churches, they do christening and assign God parenting. Somebody will step up and say, I will be uh, the spiritual advisor to this child until they become the age of accountability to the gospel. And that's, that's why they do that. I don't know how, fo how much they follow through on that bu business because I've never practiced it. But I have been, I have had members of my family uh, yeah, that belong to other denominations that would be called evangelical denominations that practice this. And I suppose if it was done proper, I mean, what, who wouldn't like to have a good spiritual advisor connected to your family for your children? I did it. And I, I did it raising my kids through people who went to my church that I knew were on the same page with me. Uh, we combined our training of our parents together. I would tell my children, if you're going to run away from out, I'm going to run away from the house. I'd say, well, okay, you can only run two places. You can run to the Baxters or you can run to this, uh, you can run to the um, Dennis's. That's the only place you can run. You hear me? Yes, sir. If they run away, they'd run to one of those two places. They would call me and say, your kid's over here. I said, we'll keep them for a weekend. And their kids, they would do the same thing. Their kids would do this. I'm going to run away home. Well, you only run two places. You can run to the Adamas or whatever. And so they'd come and spend a weekend. I suppose that's God parenting. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7, 14. And, and, and then probably, probably the most famous one is, in point, is my point four on providence of God is David. That's the classic, isn't it? Uh, God, God's approval of David's response, God's approval of David's response to the death of his son gives me the assurance that the providence of God takes care of children who died before gospel accountability. When I read 2 Samuel 12, 14 through 23, I find five points. I find five homiletical points of the message that the prophet Nathan gave to David. And that, that, you know, that's pastoral ministry right there for me. And so that was a biggie for me. First was the scriptural prophecy that was given to David. If you'd like to look, and we'll just get, glance through it, then we'll call it a night. Um, let's look at 2 Samuel, and, and it'll just help you see my outline, if for no other reason. Um, 12. I mean, this is, my, this is one of my great go-tos. <laughs> I suppose yours too. In the, and, and in my Bible my study Bible here that I have here at the church that I teach from, um, it's entitled, um, this passage is entitled, The Loss of a Child. Does yours have that? Or something close to that? Okay. Well, if you have a study Bible, Jackie, do you have a study Bible back there? What's it say at a heading? Yeah, there you go. It's going to say something about the death of a baby. Mine says the loss of a child. Um, and and uh, it starts up there, and um, Nathan goes to his house, and the, the baby is, God has told him to go tell David, your baby's going to die. And so he goes to his house, and the Lord struck the child, and the child became deathly sick, uh, 16. And, and so there's the scriptural prophecy from Nathan to David, right? Your child's going to die. And all of a sudden, the baby gets deathly sick. In 15 through 17, we have the, the, the severe sickness of the infant. David therefore inquired of, of God for the child. David fasted and went and lay all night on the ground. That's a prayer concept. 
And the elders of his household stood beside him in order to raise him up from the ground. But he was unwilling and would not eat food with them. Verse 18. Now pay attention. Seven, on the seventh day, the child died. Is that important? It is under the old covenant. Okay, that's important. Then it happened on the seventh day, the child died. See, we really are into the providence of God here, buddy. The child died. And the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, behold, while the child was still alive, we spoke to him and he did not listen to our voice. How then can we tell him that the child is dead since he might do something to himself that would be harmful? Now we're into verse 19 and 20. And for me, the servants questions. When David saw that his servants were whispering together, David perceived that the child was dead. So David said to his servants, is my child dead? They said, he is dead. So David rose, arose from the ground, washed and anointed himself, changed his clothes, and came into the house of the Lord and worshiped. You know, I don't, every year I teach on this, I tell you, the quicker you get back to the church, the better off you're going to be from a funeral. The better off you're going to be. The first, the first great adjustment is come back Come back to God and to a place of worship. The first thing he did, he, said, he went to the house of the Lord for worship. That, that, I can't tell you the healing that comes from that. Now, people, and listen, our church understands privacy. They understand sorrow and that. They're going to give you, the real spiritual people are going to give you a little bit of love and not a lot. One of the things that people fear about going back is that they're going to have to go through and talk, tell the whole story over and over and over again. In this church, that's not true. You may have a few people that do that, but, but you know that they're immature and don't know better. The rest of them are, are going to just kind of saddle up to you and say, I'm with you. Uh, my prayer is that if you have any need, you need anything from me, you call me, and they're going to push on. But see, it's about how you get well. If you really know where the, where, the, where the loved one is, if you really understand the providence of God, then get back. Get back in the saddle. Get back in the saddle. Right, Horton? Get back in the saddle. And so he arose from the ground. He worshiped and ordered himself. He changed his clothes, and he came into the house of the Lord and worshiped. Then he came to his own house. And when he had requested, they set food before him, and he ate. Verse 21 through 23. Then his servants said, what is this thing that you have done? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept. But when the child died, you arose and ate food. I mean, what parent wouldn't do that? Pray tell me, even if he knew, he's going to pray to God until the child dies, try to persuade God. Listen, who wouldn't do that? I mean, who hasn't sat next to a child's bed or in a hospital room and prayed for God to transfer that pain from that child to them? I mean, we, wouldn't even, we would do that with a dog that you love. But they, while the child was alive, he fasted and wept, and when the child died, he arose and ate food. He put on his working clothes. Went right back into life. How is that possible? See, people are curious about this stuff, aren't they? Look, David, listen, it's over. I understand what's about this. I'm back. I'm back in the saddle. And he said, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept for I said, listen, what he's, listen what he's how he's talking to God. Who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me. That the child may live. Let me show you something. Don't miss this. Here's David. He's a believer. And God can show grace to him. And David knows it. Here's the child. God's going to only provide providence of, of uh, only providence to the child. You understand? He's not a believer. Show grace. He can be gracious to me. 
maybe to show favor through me to this child. Just saying. Who knows? The Lord may have grace that the child may live, but now he's died. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? Listen, this great line. I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Isn't that a great line? Well, where do you think David's going? <laughs> Where's the old Dave going? He knows he's going to see him again. They're both going to heaven. That's one of my go-to passages for me. I, the others are good, though. The others are good. The providence of God. The providence of God, people. The providence of God tonight. Well, the concept that support this subject, this idea is that uh, we're not, <coughs> we don't go to hell because we, um, because, because of sin, right. but because we reject Christ as our Savior. Absolutely. And the, the child, the mentally uh, challenged person, yep. cannot, does not have the ability yes. to reject Christ as our Savior. Absolutely. That's absolutely it. That's absolutely it. So you got John 3, 6, 3 18. Absolutely. That's absolutely the bottom line. That's absolutely the bottom line. That's absolutely the bottom line. You, you, you go to hell because you reject the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's the truth. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful tonight for the providence of God. Every unbeliever in the whole wide world should be. I am thankful for it in my life until I could switch over to the sovereign grace of God through faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I understand the creative order and how it works under the providence of God. The birds, the fish, the dogs, the cats, all of that. The unbeliever. We pray tonight, Father, for those who have lost children might understand what God has to say about them. To the parents, he says, do not, don't hinder them from coming to, to me, to Christ. Don't hinder your children from coming to Christ. May we all be caregivers to the children of our families, our neighbors. We thank you for a great summer camp we have every year that reminds us of the importance of bringing children to Christ. We thank you for this lesson tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us.